thinking about doing SIV? Boom! In this video, all your SIV questions answered. Hi, Toby here. If you're interested in maybe doing an SIV course or learning more about it, this video is for you. In this video, we'll look at the top 10 questions that my team and I get asked quite often, all to do with SIV courses. Even if you've been on an SIV course before, I think you'll find some useful information here. Let's get straight into those questions. The first question, what's, what's the difference between SIV and wing control. Uh, I'm just passing those out to the cameraman, it's Kieran. Thank you, Kieran. So SIV stands for Simulation d'Incident Vol, which is French and roughly translates to Simulation of In-Flight Incidents. So what we're attempting to do is to simulate incidents from uh, collapses through to spins, through to all sorts of different things really, from auto rotations to twists and beyond. Wing control, on the other hand, is more about how do we control the wing and become at one with the wing, which is what we're trying to do ultimately, and avoid collapses in the first place. So SOV and wing control, there's an awful lot of overlap. I think we need both. Uh, I like to emphasise wing control because I think if we can avoid stuff happening in the first place, so much the better. We need both. Let's go on to question number two. What will I learn? So, most people learn an awful lot more than they expect, actually. You'll learn how, mainly what you're after is how to be a safer pilot. So, with knowledge and repetition of manoeuvres, you'll gain skills, and that will also lead to real confidence. I don't know about you, um, I used to fly with a kind of niggling doubt, especially before I did, I did lots of SIV courses myself years ago. Was I doing the right thing? And if a collapse happened, it kind of came out by itself, but what would I have done if it stayed in? I had a lot of niggling doubts. So I think from an SIV course, you should get rid of those niggling doubts knowledge, ability, skill and a real confidence in your flying. I like to call it skid pan training, so um, if you drive on ice, well maybe you know theoretically to steer into the the car, you know, the as it twists on the ice or slips and slides, um, and until you hit ice for the first time you'll be in, never, never quite know whether you're going to do it right or not. So it's skid pan training, if you like to fly in thermic conditions, then you like to fly in, in conditions that are already turbulent. So we're learning how to control the skids. We basically demystify situations. So some of the situations require very little skill, but we do need to recognise what's happening. And sometimes it's nothing, we don't need to do anything. So we're doing nothing at all and the wing could recover by itself. But we need to know what the situation is, experience it, and then we know what's happened and whether we need to actually get involved with the wing or we need to let it do its own thing. So it's demystifying what's going on um, and it's definitely building skills. Uh, often time we need to get involved and um, just putting our hands up is not enough. In more detail what we'll do is, I mean I like to call it the building blocks. So we start with your equipment, learning about how your equipment works, how to set your harness up properly so that you're in the right position, you're in good touch with your harness and so on. We'll move into usually the first exercises in the sky will be it's very simple collapses to build confidence, to demystify and move on progressively into more advanced manoeuvres as your skills develop. Let's move on to question, actually before I move on to question number three. The question was, what will I learn? So if you want more information, because there's so much really that you'll learn, I will put a link in to the bottom of this video and you can have a look at what I call the building blocks. Question number three. And is it scary? Uh, the answer is yes, it is. <laughs> um, I think for most people, it's a scary thing to do. And I think probably the main reason that most people 
don't do an SIV course or wind control course is because they feel scared to do one. It's new and exciting and maybe a lot of things you've done in the past are new and exciting um, and there's a little bit of fear involved. We can make it less scary by tailoring the manoeuvres to you and progressing at the right pace for you in a logical sequence. I don't believe that you should be forced through hoops. I don't believe that you have to do that exercise on day two. Some people learn faster than others. Uh, so I believe if we control the rate that you're going through the manoeuvres, we can make it not too scary. And ultimately, at the end of it, you'll have some confidence and your flying, your XC flying, will be less scary. Question number four. Da, da, da. Is it dangerous? So hopefully not. In fact, I think you'll find that it's a lot safer than flying next to rock faces in thermic conditions. Um, sometimes I see students of mine in thermic conditions and they don't always realise... <laughs> Everything's blowing away, Kieran. <laughs> they don't always realise the risks that they're exposing themselves to. So whilst it's scary, uh, the dangerous bits really are the launch and the landing, which is true of most flights. We can keep the SIV course super safe by following some safety features that I think all SIV courses should have. So we'll start by inspecting equipment. I think this is an essential part of any SIV course. The main thing we need to look at is that your reserve can function. If you do need to throw your reserve, that it will deploy properly. Lots of other features. The second feature, you'll need to be flying with a radio, but you'll also need to be flying with an earpiece. This is essential, I think, for any SIV course, that you have an earpiece attached, connected to your radio. You might be able to hear your SIV instructor with the radio in a normal manoeuvre, but if you go into a rotation, a spiral dive, even inadvertently, you won't be able to hear very clearly. That's why I believe to make it even safer, you need an earpiece so you can hear your SIV instructor clearly at all times. The third thing is a life jacket. Now, it used to be that people did SIV courses with kind of foam buoyancy aids and they're really not good enough. The problem is that if you do land in the water, which we try to avoid but, but it can happen, your harness has a lot of buoyancy and most of that buoyancy is at the back of the harness in the form of either an airbag which generally stays inflated when you're in the, in the water or a bump air that will try to turn you over in the water and hold your head down. That's why we need something much more, with much more buoyancy than just a buoyancy aid. This is a proper life jacket. Um, they come in different sizes. The size that I absolutely recommend is uh, 275 Newtons. Um, and that's because it's a lot, lot bigger. I mean, it's nice to see that most SIV courses are now using this kind of inflatable device. It has a... Let's have a quick look. It has a gas canister inside and a unit that when it touches the water causes the life jacket to inflate automatically. Um, a lot of courses are still using 150 Newton devices which are a lot, lot better than the old flotation foam things. These ones, the 275 Newton devices, have been tested independently by the DHV and I'll put a link on this video actually so you can see they're the only ones tested and recommended for SIV even with an airbag or um, the bump air that's trying to turn you over these will support you up in the water properly so I'd only go with one of these 275 Newton life jackets um, what else can we do to make it safer you'll need a boat there's no point having a uh, Water or doing an SIV course over water if you don't have a boat. You need a boat with an engine. Rowing's not good enough. Uh, two people in the boat or two boats even, maybe. Um, instructors, you'll need two of those. You'll need one on launch. It's amazing 
how often students, you might have been flying for a couple of years, 10 years, 20 years, never before have you forgotten to do up your leg straps. But what we notice on SIV courses is people, um, maybe they've got lots to remember for the, 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 the manoeuvres or they're a little bit stressed, more stressed than normal. Uh, you'll need an instructor on launch and, of course, an instructor in the boat. So if you have all of those safety features in your course, I believe that an SIV course can be safer than going cross-country. I'll finish up with uh, two things you need to avoid because these are super important and I just to give you a really full answer to the question, is it dangerous? Going in the water uh, doesn't need to be dangerous at all, but you're not allowed to spiral into the water because you hit the water too hard and we can avoid that very, very easily um, through good briefings on how to avoid it and you're not allowed to go into your wing. And again, that's very easy to avoid if we follow some simple rules. In your first SIV course, it's just unheard of. The only maneuver where it's remotely likely in your first SIV course is a full stall. Um, and again, we can avoid that very, very easily. So that's just the full answer. Let's go straight on to question number five. What are the chances of getting wet? Um, we get asked this question quite a lot. I know that you don't want to get wet. Actually, a few people do want to get wet, but most people don't want to get wet. I understand that. And we can limit your chances of getting wet. Um, never to zero. It's SIV and we're, we're pulling maneuvers and, and experimenting and, and learning new stuff. And we're doing it over water for safety reasons, but we can limit it. I think if you're on a low end wing and an A or a low B, it's very unlikely to go in the water. Harness type can also make a difference. Harnesses with seat plate and uh, harnesses that are a little bit more upright are easier to control than harnesses without a seat plate or, or cocoon harnesses either. That can make a mild difference. Maneuvers and progression I've, I've talked about already. So if we progress in a logical way and build our skills progressively, then we can also limit our chances of going in the water. What I like about operating here in Ola Deniz is we've just got a massive load of height, so we can do maneuvers that re might require a little bit more time to sort out, super high, and if it takes us a little bit of height to sort things out and get the wing flying normally again, then so be it. So maybe how high the maneuver zone is, I call that the box, the instructor skill. So you've got a skillful SIV instructor. They can certainly recognize situations very quickly, say the right thing at the right time. If you're good at following instructions, that's going to help as well. I'll just mention finally cultural factors because I'm going to tell you how many people I get in the water in just a moment. But people from certain, how to say this, how to say this in the kindest way, people from certain parts of the world are more likely to go in the water. So some people aren't as scared as others. The answer is I get probably about one in 40 of my students in the water. But you know, if you, you are less scared to go in and, and maybe you want to push it a little bit more, if you're flying a higher end wing and so on, um, maybe your chances are a little bit higher. So there you go, the chances are about 1 in 40, maybe slightly higher, it depends on all of those factors I've just talked through. If we do things in a safe way, it should be nothing to worry about. It's a nuisance more than anything. Here in Odadina's Turkey, the water's nice and warm. One thing to mention uh, is salt water. Salt water's not a problem as long as you wash the wing properly and thoroughly in fresh water. So. You need to wash the wing thoroughly before it dries out. Salt is a problem for lines and seams and metal bits on your harness. We here, me and my, my team and I use a big vat of fresh water. We don't just hose it down in the grass. A big vat of fresh water and we, we soak your equipment multiple times. We get rid of all the salt and um, we've had it thoroughly tested and the wing is sorted. It's nothing to worry about, but do if you do um, do a course over salt water, ensure that you wash your equipment before the salt starts to dry and, and wash it really thoroughly, then there's no problem. Uh, on to the next question. Do I have to do a full stall? Do I have to? Um, no, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. So. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here because there are a few instructors, um, mainly acro pilots, I, I think, more than in 
instructors saying that you should do loads of full stalls before you even go cross country. It's so unlikely, particularly if you're flying an ENA or a low ENB glider, it's so unlikely that you'll ever need to full stall your glider when you're flying in cross country, um, normal cross country conditions. So the full stall can be scary to do. Um, I call it the control alt delete. It, it is, it's, you might want it on your list of things to do. It can reset a, a very messy glider um, for, from a big cravat or something. Um, but it can be quite scary. So the answer is no, you don't need to do it. That said, I think if you're flying uh, a high B glider or an ENC glider, I think it probably should be on your list of things to do. Uh, it is the reset and maybe you'll need it if you're flying one of these more aspecty wings. I've never needed to do one myself. I thought about it once, but um, it's not something that I've ever needed. The reality is that most, and it's uh, maybe a shocking reality, the reality is that most pilots don't even have the basic skills down. And I think there's just a lot more value in us focusing on building basic skills and helping you avoid situations in the first place with lots of wing control maneuvers uh, I think there's a lot more value in doing that than going into full stalls. Let's move on to question number seven. When or at which stage uh, of my flying career should I do an SIV course? This is a, it's a bit of a tricky one actually, so uh, I don't have a very dogmatic answer. If you do an SIV course straight after qualifying with just a couple of hours under your belt, You'll, you'll probably have to go quite slowly so as not to get confused. That said, if you go fairly early on, you'll probably find it less scary. So I'll often have pilots doing a course with my team and me. And if they've been flying for 20 years, I think it can be more scary to do an SIV course. So all credit to people who are brave to do this stuff. Maybe the sweet spot is after 20 hours or something like that, but it, it does depend. I don't have a, a definite answer for you. If you're ambitious and if, you're fly, if you want to fly lots, then by all means do it, do it, you know, crack on, do one early. I think it's all about doing the right course for you and you progressing at the rate you want to progress at. Don't just do one, do another one. What's used to surprise me is how many of my students said that, well, they just learned so much more from the second one I think often your first SIV, um, it can be quite daunting. There'll be a lot of information to take on board, often doing a second course, maybe a year or two later, and things just sink in uh, a lot deeper. Question number eight. Which harness or which wing uh, should I use to do my SIV course? Use the kit you normally fly on. So. Uh, we get asked this question quite often. I think some people think, well, you shouldn't do an SIV course with a pod harness. If you normally fly with a pod harness, then I believe you should, because otherwise you'll be thinking, right, I've got this kind of upright harness because it's a little bit easier to control a wing with a collapse. But if you normally fly with a pod, if you normally fly with your high B or your C glider, do your course with your normal kit. That's the simple answer. I, I guess I'll just caveat it briefly. If you're flying a, a, a triple C glider, a competition glider, or even a, a two-line or an END glider, there is some value in maybe building your skills up on a, on a high B or a C glider first. The more aspecty wings, the END gliders, the triple C gliders can become a lot less predictable with large collapses. So there's a lot of value, I think, in building your skills up, doing two, three, four SIV courses with ENC gliders before smacking up a wing that's really, really aspecty. There we go. Not two more questions. Two more questions. Um, question number nine. How many flights will I do? I think that six to eight flights is normally enough for most people. There'll be a lot of information to take in it's probably mental fatigue for most people so there's lots of information the courses I run we try for eight flights I think quite often after six flights people are pretty full so what we'll do quite often with the last two flights is a lot of consolidation or, or even drop back to some easy maneuvers uh, to consolidate 
there's always one or two pilots that just want to do more and more and more, but normally six to eight flights is enough for most pilots. The last question, last question number 10. Where should I do an SIV course? Three, three things really. You need to do it over water. I hope that's obvious. So you can probably hear the waves in the background here. You need to do it over water. To practice stuff that's not in that safe environment is just crazy. Height, you need somewhere where you can get high over water. So there, there are several places around the world with either mountains near a body of water, either the sea or a lake, even uh, tow, tow situations so you can tow up over a lake and, and so on. And the other one is weather. You need somewhere with reliable weather. So loads of places to go. Um, we're here in Oladeniz, Turkey. I think this is the best place because two things where well, we've got the water, which is the obvious one, but we're, we've got a lot of height here. So there's a big mountain. I don't know if you can see me. It's all kind of clouded in today, which is why we're taking time to do this video. But and um, we've got super height normally and up to 2000 meters. And that's a huge advantage. It means there's a lot less pressure on you in maneuvers. We can repeat the maneuvers. So I, I really love it here. And the third one is the weather is awesomely reliable. So we can fly every day out here in Oladeniz, Turkey. The food is awesome. Shorts and t-shirt weather. It's my favorite place to teach SIV. There we go. 10 quick or the most often asked questions. If there are any other questions you have, please write them in the comments below and I will answer them. I hope you found that useful. I hope this maybe encouraged you to give SIV a go. I fully believe it will help you build skills and confidence in the air for your XC flying and, and so on. Until next time, happy landings.